So good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, our CLA online film screening and expert question and answer session about how the famous Devon coastal village of Clovelly, alongside Mitchell and Dickinson, proves that it is possible to bring listed buildings up to modern insulation standards. This is the second screening of this film, which was made at the end of last year to celebrate the groundbreaking project which is relevant for estate owners, estate planners and managers, also architects and retrofit specialists. On behalf of the CLA, I am delighted to welcome you to what I'm sure will be an informative event. My name is Anne Maidment and I am the Regional Director for the Southwest and I will be chairing the session for today. We have an excellent panel joining us today, including the Honourable John Rouse, our own Jonathan Thompson, CLA Senior Heritage Advisor, Mukti Mitchell, who is the co-founder of Mitchell and Dickinson, and Tom Coles, Managing Director of Mitchell and Dickinson. Before I share the film, a few housekeeping announcements. I should remind you that today's session is being recorded for future use, including availability to other members. Uh, microphones and videos have been muted throughout the webinar. And the format for this event is that after we have shown you the film, I will introduce our panellists in more detail, who will then answer your questions. These will be posed by myself on your behalf, and to do please feel free to ask questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please restrict your questions to the session subject matter that we're discussing today. Otherwise, do feel free to approach the CLA for advice in the usual manner. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the film. The film is 11 minutes long, so there's plenty of time to ask our experts your questions at the end. Uh, cue the film. Uh, bear with a slight technical hitch, just um, just uh, resolving that now. is lost from an old home through five areas. About 10% goes out through the loft, 20% through the glass, 30% through drafts, 25% through the walls and 15% through the floors. So to reduce the heat loss, the best things that you can do to start with are install loft insulation, draft proofing, secondary glazing and where appropriate sloping ceiling insulation. So that's what Mitchell and Dickinson was commissioned to do in the village of Clavelli. Clavelli is a fishing village built on a 400 foot cliff um, with roads so narrow that the cars can't get down and you walk down past these tiny cottages to a 14th century harbour at the base. The objectives of insulating Clavelli was to make the housing stock more warm and comfortable for the tenants, to reduce their heating costs and to meet minimum energy efficiency standards required by law to enable you to rent out your property. Very early on, I was convinced that we needed to do, uh, our approach should be fabric first, i.e. address the heat losses within the cottage, uh, rather than try and do a quick fix of installing high heat retention radiators. The disadvantages of the latter was that whilst uh, they would earn EPC points, uh, they would not uh, address our tenants' problems, which is spending 
too much money on heating the property. We topped up the loft insulation from 100 to 300 millimetres. We installed elegant, very durable and concealed brushes in the doors and windows which sealed up the drafts. And we also installed our proprietary secondary glazing system called Cozy Glazing. Now Cozy Glazing is unique because it's made of plexiglass fitted onto the windows with magnetic tape and so it's actually virtually invisible when in place. You can open your doors and windows as usual and we even developed some special catches especially for the village of Glavelli because it has these very fine wooden windows and so the end result is that those uh, properties are 40% warmer on average but if you go in nobody can tell the difference and in fact the windows look so much better than they did because they've been beautifully restored at the same time. The complexities of working in the village um, were quite extreme. All of the materials uh, come into the top of the village and they get brought down on a sledge. We took over one of the properties about halfway down the street which we used as our workshop and our storage um, place. We set up a workshop in there we then worked in, in various properties, from kind of property to property. And then of course, uh, we were working in people's homes. Most of the properties are quite small, and us and our team trying to work in, in and around those people, around their belongings in, in their homes, in quite tight spaces. So, so the team needed to be really, um, uh, really sympathetic of that environment. Uh, what we love about living here is community spirit, just the, the area itself. Everyone's so friendly. All the heating is done through through the Rayburn. Uh, it heats the hot water and also one radiator that we've got up in the top bedroom. The, the soundproofing on the, the windows is amazing. You can, with the windows open, obviously, you can hear things, but as soon as you shut the windows, especially on the top floor, it just blanks all the, all the sound out. Uh, dry air draft, draft free. You know, so yeah, it stays cosy in, in the cottage. So the, the work's been carried out in the houses, obviously all the windows, um, like I said, bespoke to every, every window has got it has to be cut to size. We've had uh, the loft insulated, obviously up through this very small hatch, but that's insulated with sheep's wool up there. Um, and because of the sloping ceilings, they had problem there, but they've devised an insulation that goes up there and the void in here. Uh, has been filled as well. So we, we don't notice any, any heat loss through the roof. And also we can tell the old fashioned way that if you've got snow on your roof and it's snowed then you've got good insulation. This is the, uh, the insulating for the windows. Um, yeah, as you can see, they quite cleverly disguised the magnetic strips. But it's like, that's simple to clean as well. The plunge you get given the day you move in. Yeah, so the magnetic strips are just on the back, obviously there and around the window. And that's, that's what holds them in, easy to clean. Just give them a quick wipe every now and again. Yeah, as simple as that for removing, it works that, that way with every window. We don't feel we're going to struggle with heating bills, because it's so efficient we'll be okay through, through the hard times. You've got several houses in the village that look alike from the outside. They are all totally unique inside. It's so cold because you've got the north wind that comes up. And when you've got a northeasterly wind, it's just like something slicing you with ice. I think my Rayburn used to be going 24 seven. And you got fed up because the amount of coal you used and wood, and we'll see living in this village, we lug that coal down the cobbles. So it was freezing, so you took a shower, you didn't sit and linger in the bath, you took a shower and you legged it to go in the front room in front of the fire to warm up. But you slept with a hoodie on a lot of the time. And obviously the roofs are just slate with um, tongue and groove. That was it. I, I was apprehensive about having people in the house because I had a two-year-old, little two-year-old, and I was expecting my next little girl. So it was a bit, just being very uneasy about, oh my God, could I cope with all of it? It wasn't the mess I was expecting. And like, if my little boy went down for a sleep, they'd have their lunch when he was having his sleep. So no, they were really good, really, really good. Right, so when the guys from Mitchell and Dickinson came, they obviously knew the houses and they're taking note of all the houses being very different. 
and we had all the window insulation put in so they did all the windows they don't have any rattly windows anymore and where you had um, the cellar obviously the houses are cob and cobbles so they've got to breathe so they use the sheep's wool insulation so you could walk in that room with no shoes on even in the winter it was beautiful and then when you went up to the top of the houses the insulation went up between the beams you wouldn't have known they'd been once they'd been they didn't take anything away from the building and i actually remember the first day after they'd done it I, I got my little boy dressed out of the bath and that, and he ran round in shorts and pyjamas in November, shorts and t-shirt pyjamas, and I didn't have fleecy pyjamas and a hoodie on. And I didn't put slippers on for the first time, because we had no drafts coming through the floors. <laughs> it was like, we don't need to light that fire down there, so we didn't, and the Rayburn only burnt through half a bag of coal in that whole day and night, which was like, what? We just, you, you couldn't comprehend it because I'd gone from using a, to a bag, and a, or a bag and a half, to using half a bag in a whole day. Since they did all the insulation in the windows, you really don't need to use this that often, because it gets too hot in here. Really hot. Take the catch out, it's a magnet, and you lift it, and you just pull it off. Simple as that. And then we can show you that you don't have to take it off to open the windows. I can push this one up, which goes over and you can see it behind and it just slides up and down. You wouldn't even know it was on. In conclusion, it has been a massively expensive project for Clavelli Estate to embark on. However, we are pleased with the result, Na namely that our tenant's heating bill has been reduced uh, and the thermal efficiency of our cottages has been significantly improved without detracting from the beauty of those cottages. By actually doing the work, we've, we've, we've proved that it's possible to carry out you know, quite complex installation works in a, in a very complex environment. We were adamant that we wanted to uh, fit insulation to save carbon from leaking from, from these properties and, and we found a method for doing it. The most important outcome is that the tenants have reported anecdotally that they're so much warmer and more comfortable and that means that the properties in Clavelli are regarded in the local area as nice properties to live in in the 21st century and you can be warm and comfortable and the heating bills are reasonable. We actually reduced the heat loss from the properties by about 40% and many tenants reported that they were saving about half to a third of their heating bills so that was really important. And also for the, for the planet, there was massive carbon savings, um, about 5,000 tonnes of CO2, we estimate, were saved by the installation as a whole over the lifetime of those products. CO2 emissions from heating Britain's homes represent 20% of the nation's carbon footprint. So insulating Britain's old housing stock is going to be an essential part of enabling Britain to meet its 2050 carbon reduction targets. There's a sense that we've, that we've fitted you know, high-tech insulation measures into a historical village to the point where you can barely see that we've been there, um, but we've had a significant impact on, on the people that live in the properties. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we're going to move on to um, a Q&A session with our panel of experts. And so just to give you a little bit more background about um, the, the panel themselves. So we have the Honourable John Rouse, who is chair of Covelli Estate Company, which owns and manages the 120 plus listed cottages and houses, which make up the village of Covelli. 
He is a pioneer among landlords in his work in the field of energy saving and won Landlord of the Year in last year's Energy Efficiency Awards. We also have Jonathan Thompson. He is Senior Heritage Advisor for the CLA. He is involved in the development of heritage policy in England and Wales and sits on many bodies, including the Historic Environment Forum. We have Mukti Mitchell, who is the co-founder of Mitchell and Dickinson, who you would have seen in the film, and the inventor of Cozy Glazing, which you saw in the film, and founder of carbonsavvy.uk. He is an expert in low carbon living and a regular speaker at events on energy and carbon saving and a contributor to the Committee on EPC Reform. And finally, Tom Coles, the Managing Director of Mitchell and Dickinson, started his career with the company as a project manager in charge of the Clavelli installations. He continues to design large scale installation installations for estate owners and public sector organizations as part of his work with the company. So to start with, I'd like to ask a question of Jonathan, if I may. So Jonathan, I'd like to um, ask a question about where you feel from a policy point of view in the CLA, where you believe the biggest challenges are at present when it comes to decarbonisation of heritage properties um, from what you're seeing and working with within the CLA. Thanks, Anne. Now, that's an enormous question. I'm, Sorry about that. <laughs> I answer all of it right now. Um, but there uh, clearly are a lot of problems. What we do know, because we did this heritage survey recently among CLA and Historic Houses members, uh, is that a lot of owners want to decarbonise their buildings. Um, as at Clavelli, um, we it, it looked as though 86% of owners were keen to decarbonise. Uh, so there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, it's rather more difficult to work out what to do and how to do it and whether it needs consent. Um, of those 86%, 87%, for example, were worried about whether it needed consent or not and saw consent as a barrier. Uh, as to what you do, um, I mean, probably the best advice I can give is to look at CLA guidance notes. There's one in particular, lots of guidance notes on this, but one in particular called Reducing Heating Costs, which you get from the CLA website. And that has a list of good things to do um, to your building. Um, so I've been going on for hours now, but um, probably that the best starting point is not the EPC, which is pretty unreliable. We may come back to that later on. Um, but that CLA guidance as to what the best things to do are. And there's a list in the guidance note of the best thing with the best things to do at the top and the worst things to do at the bottom, which is probably a good starting point. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come to Mukti Ness. There's a, there's a couple of questions here about the secondary glazing. First of all, could you remind everyone what it's called? Um, and also, uh, there's been a question here about whether this is recognised by EPCs. Yeah, thank you. And um, so it's called cosy glazing. Um, and it is recognised by EPCs as a generic form of secondary glazing. Um, in the process of reform of EPC calculations, um, we're looking at the possibility of giving cosy glazing its own category because um, it may be more efficient than other forms of, of secondary glazing because it uses plexiglass, which is um, a much more effective insulation material than glass. Um, and so um, it may, may be that in time um, it'll have its own category, but for the moment um, it's recognised along with all other forms of secondary glazing and they do uh, give you EPC points. So typically in the village of Clavelli, um, you've got um, about four points for adding secondary glazing, um, four EPC points. I think around one point for draft proofing typically one point for loft insulation and um, up to 10 points for sloping ceiling insulation. So that's a very popular measure. Um, I don't agree with the number of points, particularly draft proofing should get a lot more points than that because uh, it's probably the most cost effective and most effective measure you can do. Um, but that gives you a bit of an idea of, of the benefits uh, from, from a um, EPC point of view. 
Brilliant. And and there is a, a question on whether the panels are designed to be removed during the summer months or do they stay on all year round? They're not designed to be removed. I mean, you can remove them. Very rarely um, we actually have customers who say, look, I want to just have because you can it's sometimes a little bit less expensive to rather than fit them onto the opening casement or sash, fit them over the whole window. But um, we usually recommend that they're fitted to the opening casement or the opening sash, and then you don't need to take them off. People people report, customers report that they take them off once every five years. I've got them in my own home. I probably take them off once every couple of years to give them a quick wipe out behind. Um, but um, you don't need to take them off in the summer months, which, which means that they're more likely to last. Um, they're less likely to get damaged in any way. There is a question of the average cost per window um, as well, but whether you'd like to answer that or if you'd like them to contact you. <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I probably should pass over. I don't know if you feel able to say anything about that, Tom. I'm a bit um, out of touch of the up-to-date prices. Um, yeah, I think uh, our work is so bespoke that we would like the opportunity to um, for our surveyors to analyse each individual property and actually work out the, the best um, solution for uh, insulation from our packet of measures. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll abstain from giving a, 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 a price uh, at this stage. Thank you. OK, um, John, I'd like to turn to you, if I may. Um, there is a, a question here that was also on my mind about what the driver was behind the work for Covelli. Um, and were there any alternatives that you considered as well? Uh, we started off by always wanting to improve the thermal efficiency of the cottages. Uh, and that began with uh, lining flues because an awful lot of heat from our uh, traditional cottages uh, is lost through the chimney. And so we had these isochern and Mukti became one of our tenants, and I talked to him about the thermal efficiency because we were aware that EPC uh, regulations were threatened. Uh, and that is when this conversation started. I think the, the most important factor from my angle was that the external appearance of the cottages should not be altered. And equally, um, the cottage rooms were quite small and so we didn't want to reduce them further by for instance replastering the interior of the cottages to improve their um, insulation and so that led on with my discussions with Mukti to the system that we then implemented and just briefly to we did um, as you heard in the film refer to the question of quick fix of uh, uh, high heat retention radiators, but rejected that on the grounds of um, costs of running them, which we felt were going to be absorbent for our tenants who are um, and unaffordable therefore. So whilst it would have solved the EPC question, uh, it would not have solved our tenants' problem of uh, heating their properties in an affordable way. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here with regards to to the insulation and the, the perhaps the impacts that might have on on a heritage property. One here, um, one of our members asked, uh, open fires are generally said to need to, to draw to work properly. Um, and how does this work if all drafts are stopped up? Um, so that's one question here. And the, just to link to that as well. Um, uh, Jenny has said, uh, have there been any reports of increased condensation uh, since the measures were installed? Installed, And if so, how have you dealt with this? So I'm not sure who would like to take that. I'll, 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 I'll start. Uh, okay. Thanks. On that last point, condensation, um, we do try and emphasise to our tenants that um, they have now got it in their control to minimise uh, condensation and improve it. The heating within their uh, homes by opening, positively ventilating, uh, as opposed to relying on draft. 
I mean, in old properties, you will still have some residual drafts going through them, but uh, we do believe that we have reduced them significantly through Mission Dickinson's work, mm -hmm. uh, but um, tenants are encouraged to, um, as I say, to open windows, to allow the um, cottages to air, and um, my solution to most condensation problems is to encourage people to both uh, keep the cottages reasonable on a low uh, heat level, but um, keep them to keep them ventilated. And so we haven't had the short answer is we haven't had any increased problem from condensation as a result of the draft grouping. Did I miss the first part of the question? <clears throat> I'm happy to answer that first part, uh, uh, John. Um, so um, essentially, that's absolutely right. Fires need to draw, so they need some ventilation. And of course, people need good quality air um, uh, to breathe. And, and in fact, with all properties, um, the buildings themselves need to breathe because a certain amount of moisture is percolating up through the walls and floors in most uh, many old properties. And so there needs to be good exchange of air. So the aim at Mitchell and Dickinson is actually to reduce the drafts by 70%. Now, it's a very kind of loose figure, really, because it depends how severe the drafts are in the first place. And when you've got really old, many of the windows and, and doors in Clavelli were over 100 years old, which is fantastic. And we often work on windows that are over 100 years old. So they can have quite big gaps and therefore reducing the drafts by 70% actually you, you know is a, it brings them brings drafts down to a reasonable level but there still is background level of ventilation and it's certainly the case that if one was to go further and really complete um a, a sort of what i like to call the deep retrofit a level of um draft proofing where you're really aiming to reduce drafts by say 95 percent then it probably would be essential um, to have uh, mechanical ventilation systems installed. And I think, you know, this is true of all um, low carbon buildings built today, um, very low energy buildings. And I believe that by 2050, all British homes will have mechanical ventilation because it's much more energy efficient. As they say in the, in the retrofit industry, build tight, ventilate right. It's much more energy efficient to actually seal up the whole property and then have mechanical ventilation because mechanical ventilation is very low cost to run. And so that's an, a type of extractor fan with combined with inlets as well um, that maintains a good level of fresh air in the property throughout the year. If, you, if you've got natural drafts, then you have really high levels of ventilation in the winter gales but then you don't have enough ventilation in, in still weather. Um, and so that's the future um, uh, for retrofitting is mechanical ventilation. But for the moment, the most important thing, as John said, is that once you've had draft proofing fitted, you then have control of the ventilation. So then you need to be more proactive in throwing open all the windows on, on for an hour in the middle of the day on nice days throughout the year, ideally, in order to keep the property um, uh, well ventilated. Great, thank you. Um, and and uh, leading on from that, and and, and linked to um, open fires, it's actually heating systems in general. Um, and there's a question uh, from somebody asking if you um, had to update any of the heating systems in the properties as part of this work, and if so, what was used? Uh. Most of our, the topography of Trevelli is it's a little village built on a 400 foot cliff. So we've got no utilities like uh, gas and oil uh, available for our cottages. Uh, most rely therefore on uh, ray burns and wood burners. Um, and uh, so we uh, have simply uh, maintained or increased the number of fleas uh, in cottages particularly where tenants requested them. I mean, some tenants actually didn't like the Rayburn because they're a bit, they feel them a bit old fashioned, but they are keen on the wood burners and uh, uh, they are effective. So we haven't 
uh, change the heating system that much. We've just encouraged people to use perhaps more wood burners. Uh, and they've gone down um, very well. And uh, as I say, we've lined the flues to both improve the thermal efficiency, but also to reduce the power risk as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that one. Um, a, a technical question with regards to the installation um, has come through. Could you run through the insulation buildup of the sloped soffits? Yeah, sure. Should, should, should I take that one? Great. Um, thank you, John. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as as is mentioned, because of the uh, nature of the properties in Clavelli, um, some of the living space is either completely or partly um, in the roof space. So, um, in that instance, there's obviously uh, uh, most likely uh, dwarf walls and then uh, sloping ceilings. Um, that either run into a pitch or in, into a flat ceiling above. Um, so where there's a flat ceiling, we were able to um, to lay loft insulation up, up into that void. And typically we, we used uh, natural sheep's wool. Um, uh, and then where there's sloping ceilings uh, and where we were confident that there was a sufficient um, air gap between the ceiling and the um, uh, slates, we we overboarded those those ceilings, so we didn't we didn't remove any ceilings from from the properties in Clavelli. Um, we overboarded with uh, PIR insulation, um, and then plasterboard, uh, and then skimmed over the plasterboard, and then decorated. Um, we typically um, uh, used seventy mil PIR. Um, obviously, we had to take into account the, uh, the headspace uh, in, in order that the rooms were still uh, workable uh, and, um, and, and also making sure that we, that we fitted the insulation uh, in, in and around the, uh, nat the uh, original woodwork. So where there was uh, uh, rafters and purlins uh, exposed in the ceilings. We try to maintain that as a as, as a visual aesthetic, um, and obviously our plaster work often follow the undulations that of of the of the, of the natural of, of the original building. Um, the complexities obviously are that we were working in quite tight spaces, so often having to cut the material outside and then and then bring it up in pieces um, in order for it to be able to be brought up through the through the stairs, uh, et cetera. Okay. Listening to that, I think that leads quite neatly onto another question we've had from uh, Will Langer. Um, and it's, have you found there to be any problems with the conservation officers when it comes to retrofitting uh, listed properties and the work that you were doing in Clavelli? Can I answer that one, Tom? I I spoke to the conservation officer uh, in our region, in, in, in the region of Clavelli, North Devon, um, before we begun the installation and talked it through with her. And um, she said that in principle, it, none of it requires listed building consent. The one major caveat she had is that particularly where there were lath and plaster ceilings, um, uh, and particularly the sloping ceilings in lath and plaster that we, we were not to damage or remove the existing lath and plaster so that the system is effectively reversible. So you've got the four measures, the loft insulation, the draft proofing, the secondary glazing and the sloping ceiling insulation, um, which are, work together to, to achieve approximately 40% reduction of heat loss. And um, the secondary glazing, again, the, the key thing, and this is this applies to conservation officers all across southern England, and we've we've worked with dozens and dozens of them, and most of them absolutely love the cosy glazing system because it's it's reversible and invisible from outside. And those are the two major things that they want to know. If it's reversible and invisible from outside, usually you don't even have to go through the listed building consent application process. Of course, sometimes grade one listed buildings, I mean, King's College, Cambridge, for example, I walked around with the conservation officer there and we would need to um, file for 
listed building consent in properties like that, but they're still very positive about giving consent. And I think the, 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 the kind of brushes, draft proofing brushes, routing in a brush to windows, that's quite standard um, practice now. And conservation officers are approving that regularly for, um, for listed buildings. Of course, mostly we're talking about grade two. So again, if you have a grade one listed building, I think it's worth actually contacting your conservation officer to check. Um, and then loft insulation, again, there's no question around that. So overall, this package is received really well. Um, with conservationist uh, officers across southern England and yeah they're, they're quite happy in Clovelly. Okay and obviously not all heritage properties are necessarily listed so are there any um, challenges around planning consents in general? Is, is, is anything required for any of the works or, or, or is this something you're seeing that actually as you say conservation officers are, are more um, understanding in, in, in the work that you're doing? Absolutely. Um, there's no uh, planning requirements around these measures because, again, they're considered relatively, in a sense, somewhat temporary, i.e. that they're reversible. You can take the loft insulation out. You can take the secondary glazing away. It just will damage the paintwork a little bit. So um, conservation officers, I mean, I, my experience, and I've, I've spent ages talking to conservation officers for, for years and years and years, and they're often really concerned about energy efficiency. They're often very interested in the environment and they want to find solutions that will work, but they also have to do their job, which is to protect Britain's heritage buildings and, and not lose its special features, et cetera. And so um, compared to putting in say, for example, conservation double glazing, which is approved in some regions, um, you can put in this very fine double glazing, which is, um, the whole unit is only about 12 millimetres. Um, but if you do that, you're, you're throwing away all that beautiful old glass with the bubbles, etc. And the old glass is a bit more of a, has a white quality as opposed to modern, modern glass, which is slightly green um, in colour. So um, the glass is, is really important. Um, and then you're not, you're not routing into the timbers. So secondary glazing often has much less impact for example, than any form of conservation or normal double glazing. So my genuineness is the conservation officers sort of welcome the system with open arms, say, ah, oh, last something we can easily um, give a tick to, and, and we're also doing our job at preserving the historic fabric. I should maybe just add uh, that um, as, a, as, a, as a company, obviously, the Clavelli project has, has been a, has been a big part of our work, but we we actually have uh, you know amassed uh, thousands of customers, um, and uh, in, all of those customers pretty much uh, are in period properties. Most of them are in listed properties. From time to time, our customers do seek planning permission, um, and we have. Um, skills in-house to, to help people through that process but I, I should just say that we, we've where that's been applicable there's there's never been an objection um, so our, our systems are, uh, are as, as Mukti said are well received by listed building officers and conservation officers um, and, and our teams are trained you know this this idea that our insulation is invisible from the outside. It, 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 it sounds like a kind of easy statement to uh, come up with, but the practicalities of that are, are obviously complex. It involves high skill woodworking, bespoke beads. Um, it takes a lot of care and attention, a lot of design before we even start the, inst the installation. So that is really the, the, the um, the foundations of the company and, and how our craftspeople and, and our surveyors are trained. Of course. And perhaps just to add to that, to give a little bit even more detail, um, the really important point Tom's made is just to say that the difference between the cosy glazing system and the sort of old fashioned secondary glazing is old fashioned secondary glazing. You have your existing window and you simply put another window on the inside of it, a completely separate window. And so it doesn't affect the original window, but it also doesn't repair the original window. With our systems, they're integrated into the original window. So actually, 
the original window has to be refurbished and, and made to work really smoothly. So actually these, these old windows, often 100 years old or more, are put back into full working condition and kind of given a new lease of life. And that is a large part of the work that we have to do to install the secondary glazing. So it's it's um, it's it actually increasing the, the 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 lifespan of these old windows. And actually, talking about the windows themselves, there is a question about whether all of the windows comprised of timber sashes, or whether also lead or critter windows as well, um, and whether this can apply to a variety of windows. I know, having seen Clavelli myself, that actually the architecture is is very varied. It's part of the uniqueness of Clavelli. So I presume that that was the case. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. There was. There's a there's a there's a good mixture of windows um, styles, um, and, and in fact, there the there there were there aren't very many um, uh, sash windows. Uh, although uh, the bulk of the work that we do at Mitchell and Dickinson tends to be on sash windows, um, but there there's a mix um, of sash windows, uh, opening casements most typically. Um, and the casements are actually hinged on um, on uh, uh, Clavelli hinges that are quite that are quite unique to the village, um, uh, and and also um, there there are some metal windows with with leaded lights, um, and uh, our treatment, as as I said right at the start when I was asked a question about the pricing, our we are able to to work with all different styles and sizes of windows. Um, our treatment is slightly different to, uh, uh, depending on what we find, um, but um, we've we've not encountered a, a window yet that, that we've not been able to um, fit our cozy glazing system to. So sometimes uh, we're not always able to, to fit the cozy glazing in, in, in an integrated way, i.e. It's it's able to be the windows able to be operated uh, as as it was designed with the cozy glazing in place. Sometimes we're forced to fit a fixed unit, which would need to be removed in order to open and close the window. But we 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 actually typically try to to fit the cozy glazing in, in an integrated way to uh, enable ventilation and uh, enable the end user to to, to be able to function. Uh, open and close their window as as it's intended. Okay, thank you, um, John. A question uh, for you with regards to um, the works and and the EPCs band C. Um, was this sufficient for band C? And if not, what does Clavelli plan to do next to reach C? Um, and and will Mitchell and Dickinson be helping you? Do you have other plans to reach the the gap between E and C? Uh, and that's a very good point. Um, once, whilst we feel that we've achieved the objective of um, improving thermal efficiency of our properties, we certainly have not achieved what I'd hoped to, which was, as you say, something between E and C on the, uh, according to the current um, formulation of the EPC calculation. Um, uh, so we are up to, um, that E level anyway, for, or, and we've got some exemptions, um, or we've got many exemptions because we've exceeded the um, expenditure per property that is required for an exemption. Uh, the next move actually has been with the help of CLA to try and lobby the uh, powers who, who do the formulation uh, of the EPC make them uh, take into account uh, heat losses which do occur through draft proofing, which I, we don't think are correctly reflected within the EPC calculus. Uh, and secondly, uh, <clears throat> the thermal, the U value, the thermal efficiency of these traditional uh, cottage walls, which again, we feel uh, underestimate their, uh, their thermal efficiency. So, uh, on the one hand, with the help of uh, CLA and indeed 
a number of other estates, we have been lobbying uh, for that change. Um, uh, and the next move, is, I think, Brad, I'm afraid it's to rely on the exemption, um, but to carry on the discussion uh, about the formulation. Hmm. Thank you. And, and so, yeah, so it hasn't, yeah. in that sense, I'm afraid it hasn't achieved all the objectives that we originally thought it might have been. Um, but um, the primary one, it has achieved. But quite a leap. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, and Jonathan, uh, I've got a question here about um, the issues that uh, members um, are highlighting when it comes to improving energy efficiency in heritage properties. How would you summarize that? Is that is it planning or is it simply knowing where to start and 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 what advice do you give them? Um, there are a whole series of issues there. Um, <laughs> also, I keep giving you the very the, broad subject. Sorry. <laughs> the incompetence of EPCs, which has already been referred to, the, the measurement measurement methodology which underlies them is extremely inaccurate, measures buildings wrongly, measures interventions wrongly. Um, a lot of EPC recommendations, particularly solid wall insulation, which is almost always there as a recommendation, is actually potentially quite dangerous in all buildings. You can end up with damage to the building and, and the health of the occupiers. Um, EPCs generally hugely understate the financial costs of their recommendations, um, and they completely ignore embodied carbon. So there were kinds of problems with EPCs, uh, all of which basically are fixable. Um, the government is not doing a great deal to fix them, or hasn't so far. Um, there are some things being done. The, the um, accuracy of... The ratings for solid walls, for example, is being improved. Mukti and I have been working on that and various other things this last year. Um, but government is really not so far addressing this problem. So it's, you know, it's something we've been working on for 10 years and we will carry on. One day we'll get there. Um, but it's, it's, it's a slow process. Um, going back to that specific question, I, I suppose there are kind of two answers. First one is that to a great extent, we do know the answers as to what the good things to do are. And essentially, they're pretty much the things that Mitchell and Dickinson have been telling us about, the sort of low-hanging fruit, um, loft insulation, um, low voltage lighting, secondary glazing, um, things like that, which are relatively low cost, secondary glazing rather more expensive, um, which is relatively cost and low cost and if they actually work and they're cost effective and um, they don't carry risk to the building. So the great thing is to find out what those things are and to do them. CLA guidance notes will help with that. Um, then the, the second question, of course, is this compliance issue. Not such an issue if, you know, for an owner, owner occupier, not so bad at the moment because nothing very much you're obliged to do in a team, apart from having an EPC if you want to sell. Um, but in future that may change. But if you have got on that building and you've got this issue of having to get E or potentially get to C in future, that's really, really challenging. As, as John was saying, um, part of the answer will be to change the rules. Um, part of it will be if you've got a listed building or a heritage building, you can potentially get exemption for it. Uh, which is an important point that not many people realise they are not automatically exempt. It's something you have to work on, essentially, very briefly. You need to get an EPC as a starting point. You need to look at the recommendations, carry out the ones that aren't going to damage the heritage value of the building, then get another EPC. And if that contains only recommendations that would damage the heritage value of the building, then the building becomes exempt from the need for an EPC, and also, therefore, exempt from the MES regulations. That all sounds rather technical. Again, it's covered in CLA and its notes, which I hope we can refer to at the end. Um, so that's a very, very brief summary. So there are lots of problems, um, but there are solutions to them and, and ways around them. So it's not a completely bleak picture. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I've just got two more questions before we, we finish up. Um, one is, uh, John, are you considering the commercial premises at Clavelli um, at the moment uh, or in the future? Um, the, these types of properties seem to have harder hurdles to overcome than the EPC targets. Uh, yes, we are. We've, um, we have, our commercial properties actually appear to have reasonable 
um, EPC levels at the moment. Uh, but we are, for instance, down the village street, we have got um, two or three shops, and those we have uh, upgraded along with our residential properties. Um, sawmills, I don't think we have done any work on yet. Absolutely. And, and and just finally, from yourself, John, having gone through this experience, um, so have you got any final uh, words of wisdom or advice for heritage property owners? How did it work with the tenants? And as a landlord, have you seen any tangible business benefits having carried out this work? Um, I think um, there's initial scepticism from our tenants about having this intervention in their properties. Uh, Mitchell and Dickinson's craftsmen, however, did such a good job that I think they overcame that uh, skepticism uh, and um, people were coming along uh, and uh, indeed inviting and uh, us to have a look and saying, yes, they've now changed their mind and they are um, some of our best flag waivers for the EP, for the uh, uh, insulation actually have been the people who are the most skeptical to begin with. So it has worked for um, the properties. It has improved their thermal insulation. We have seen, seen, although there's a certain amount of naked cunning about uh, the results, there have, there have been significant admissions of uh, lower heating bills. Uh, and uh, that's great from our angle because equally the cottages then become more tenable and we can um, point to these improvements and. Uh, over time, uh, increase the rental value of the of the properties. Uh, so that's that's all positive. Uh, I would say that the cost, as against the increase in rental, has not uh, wouldn't attract uh, too many financiers. But it's all going in the right direction for the long term sustainability of the village and its uh, um, requirement to adapt to current circumstances uh, and current um, uh, pressures. So um, we're pleased we've made the investment. Uh, we would love it if we've got EPC recognition as well, but um, uh, it's uh, moving in the right direction. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm afraid uh, we are running out of time, so I, I'm going to finish there. Um, but thank you so much to our panel of John and Jonathan, Mukti and Tom. Um, please do uh, contact uh, Mitch and Dickinson. And of course, we have advice at the CLA and a suite of guidance notes with which Jonathan has worked on, which we will send you a list of the ones to look at after the, the webinar. Um, and I hope this afternoon has shown you that it is possible to insulate listed and period properties in a sympathetic way. Um, and this is certainly one example of where it has been achieved successfully. Um, it's not always easy, but, but it can be done. Um, we have a, a number of future events for you, uh, three of which I have listed um, here for you to make a note of. Next week on Wednesday, we have a women's network lunch at the Beaufort Polo Club. Uh, we also have um, a number of uh, agricultural transition roadshow events happening across England, uh, four of which are across the Southwest region on the 27th and 28th of March to help guide you through uh, what is happening at the moment in um, agricultural transition and environmental land management schemes. Uh, and also we have our first uh, next generation conference and dinner in Shropshire. It's a national event, um, but it should prove to be uh, very interesting in terms of the subject matter. So I hope to see you at one or all of those events. Um, and finally, if you could uh, possibly give us some feedback, um, either via the QR code, but we will also send you a link after the webinar. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to your for your questions. And if you'd like to ask any further or follow up, please do contact us in the regional office. Thank you very much all.